Hi, you are watching. In the previous chapter, Andreas finally caved in and accepted Lucia's proposal. With her assistance, he successfully brewed an advanced potion he recognized from the game. Surprisingly, this revealed that his abilities were more powerful than he initially thought, as he could also evolve his traits. As the midter revaluations began, they were randomly assigned to groups, much to Andrea's dismay. He found himself paired with the most troublesome individuals. Undiscouraged, they embarked on their mission and met with the Baron, who seemed to have some knowledge about their assignment. However, their suspicions were aroused by the Baron's and his subordinates' questionable behavior. To avoid any further delays, they swiftly made their way to the Trim Village. Now on to the next part. A few moments later, the group was still inside the carriage, speeding towards their destination as fast as they could. With nothing else to do, Christopher asked what their plan was after arriving at the village and suggested finding a place to stay. Ivy, however, disapproved, emphasizing that the investigation should take priority. They needed to start by examining the landlord's castle first, because even if the whole thing was suspicious, all they could do for now was to check it out directly. As they continued their conversation, Andreas suddenly felt a strange sensation in his mana, growing stronger the closer they got to the village. Perplexed, he wondered what was happening to him. Before he could find any answers, the carriage began to shake uncontrollably. With this, Christopher went to open the side of the window and asked the coach what the fuck was going on with their carriage, but as soon as he what the coach was doing, shock filled his face as he witnessed the coach was uncontrollably beating the horse's meat and was drooling all over the place like a maniac. So it became evident that the coach was under the influence of some substance, causing the carriage to travel at an alarming speed. So without hesitation, Christopher informed his teammates about the situation. And as expected of Ivy, the team's supervisor, promptly devised a plan and kicked the door open to assess their chances of escape. Unfortunately, it was already too late to jump to safety. So she immediately warned everyone to brace for impact, knowing they were about to crash into the main gate. True to her warning, the carriage crashed through the gate at full speed, landing in the center of the village. But despite the chaos they caused and the lifeless body of the coach lying on the ground, villagers seen unfazed, continuing their dance as if they were also under the influence of some substance. The group quickly realized that this bizarre behavior was prevalent throughout the town. Christopher turned to Andreas, expecting answers about what was happening to the villagers. As a mage, Andreas should have some insight. And as he expected, Andreas was confident in his conclusion and believed that it was more than just a man anomaly and the fact that his mana was reacting indicated the presence of black magic. Shortly after, a child under the influence of black magic attacked them. Fortunately, they swiftly disabled his movements. They couldn't help but notice that this child possessed extraordinary strength, far beyond what a normal child would have. And since he had been dancing the whole day, his feet were visibly worn out from all the movement. Now the group is certain that they are dealing with a curse. However, what's peculiar is that the landlord has been missing for about a month, if the villagers have been dancing non-stop since then, they should have died from exhaustion a long time ago. It becomes evident that someone is taking care of them, ensuring they don't meet their demise. This realization dawns upon them and they understand that they have unwittingly gotten themselves tangled up in something troublesome. As Andreas contemplated the situation, he couldn't help but recall that the previous version of himself didn't die in this game. So if they had followed the butler's suggestion and rested in the castle, the Baron would have likely covered up the situation. However, since they arrived in the village promptly, everything has changed. They have been dragged into a perilous predicament. Adding to the confusion, the mana that Andreas sense is at a similar level to Charon's, but using it on such a large scale seems peculiar to him. As he delves deeper into his thoughts, Andreas realizes the possibility that the perpetrator is utilizing an artifact to achieve this. As they contemplated their next steps, Christopher noticed Andreas's sudden silence and couldn't resist asking if something was amiss to which Andreas confessed that they had very few clues to work with at the moment, emphasizing the need to thoroughly search the landlord's house for any valuable information. With this, they concluded it was the logical choice to make, so the group made their way towards the mansion. However, as they approached, a gruesome scene greeted their eyes, a sight that could only be described as a barbecue gone wrong. The bodies of unfortunate souls were tied up and burned to a crisp, their crispy exteriors reminiscent of charcoal briquettes. Undiscouraged by the Macamber spectacle, they pressed on, their resolve unshaken. Then Ivy, displaying her signature boldness, kicked open the door, revealing a haunting interior. Countless lifeless bodies lay strewn across the floor, their presence casting an eerie atmosphere. Upon closer inspection, Christopher's sharp eyes caught sight of a body wearing the attire of the Empire investigation team, and it seemed like a considerable amount of time had likely passed since these individuals met their untimely demise. As the pieces of the puzzle started to come together, 
Andreas couldn't help but share a daring theory with the group. He suggested that perhaps they wouldn't be able to solve this mystery on their own because, based on their findings so far, he believed that a black mage was behind it all. Ivy, confused by this assumption, questioned Andreas about the grounds for his theory. Andreas explained that he sensed something amiss in the emotions of the people in the village. It felt as though someone was manipulating their emotions and harnessing them for magical power. And after all, human emotions were the driving force behind black magic. This led him to speculate that the landlord was likely killed because he would oppose an obstacle to the black mage's plans, and the burning bodies outside the mansion seemed to be part of a sinister black magic ritual. But these were only assumptions, so Ivy concludes that they would eventually uncover the truth by capturing the culprits. Therefore, she rallied everyone and ordered a thorough search of every nook and cranny in the mansion. With this, the group diligently calmed through each room determined to find any clues that would shed light on the situation. However, despite their efforts, they came up empty-handed. They hadn't even found the landlord's corpse. As they continued their investigation, their attention was drawn to the mind-controlled villagers congregating outside the mansion. It was as if they were waiting for the group to enter the building. This realization sent a chill down their spines as it became clear that the perpetrator was finally making their move. As the situation took a sudden turn, Hazard turned to their supervisor, seeking guidance on their next move. It was evident that they needed to stop their search and leave the building. Ivy commanded Hazard to find an escape route, and he immediately sprang into action. However, surprisingly, hordes of mindless villagers sprinted towards them, quickly reaching the second floor of the mansion, catching Hazard off guard. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, Christopher came to Hazard's rescue just in the nick of time, saving his ass from the approaching danger. The group was about to get into formation when something unexpected happened. The villagers began to bloat exponentially, and with a deafening explosion, they burst, injuring Christopher where he stood. As Christopher lay on the ground, Andreas witnessed the traumatic scene unfold before him, triggering his PTSD from his previous life. Paralyzed by fear, he found himself unable to move, hanting frantically in panic. Thankfully, Ivy and the others swiftly recognized something was wrong with Andreas and rushed to his aid, and they helped him to his feet and guided him out of the mansion, opting to leap out of a window to escape. However, the relentless villagers continued their pursuit, chasing the group relentlessly. Andreas, regaining his composure, activated his ability called Grease to hinder the villagers' advances, but since Andreas was still in his panicked state, he also used another skill without considering his mana storage. With this, Ivy questioned his actions, reminding him not to use up his mana recklessly and instead focus on tracking the Black Mage's location, which Andreas was confident that he could do just that since the Black Mage was using his mana so blatantly. So he activated his mana detection ability, scanning every corner of the village, and as expected, he detected the whereabouts of the Black Mage. So he quickly informed Ivy of a location for which she was grateful, and they made their way there with lightning speed. At the same time, Ivy's teammates struggled to keep up with her incredible speed. With this, in a matter of seconds, they arrived at the designated location, while the perpetrator was just observing them from the other side of a window. And without hesitation, Ivy kicked open the door and entered the room. Suddenly, a barrier materialized, separating Ivy from her teammates. It became clear that it was a trap all along. To make matters worse, Ivy found herself trapped in her deepest trauma, confronted by the image of a long-deceased sibling. As this event unfolded, Andreas found himself unable to break the barrier on his own as it was beyond his power. Surprisingly, an unexpected voice echoed, expressing pity for how they had become trapped, likening their predicament to moths drawn to a flame. And in an instant, the barrier encompassed the entire village and the voice continued, telling him that there was no need to rush things since everything was ordained by God, while urging Andreas to embrace the name of Sloth and Meal before it. This revelation startled Andreas, leaving him to wonder why this name was appearing now. And he was this surprised because the title of this game is Great Sin. And starting with Sloth, the seven deadly sins were split off from the main body, the Codex Apocalypse, and by collecting all of them. Someone can summon the last boss. These are the most important items for the story, but what puzzled Andreas was why the name was mentioned here in the countryside, a place that didn't even appear in the main storyline. With this newfound knowledge, Andreas understood that he couldn't tackle this challenge alone. So he made the decision to join forces with the others for now. After all, facing a formidable enemy like the one behind the barrier required teamwork and strength in numbers. But as Andreas approached his teammates, he couldn't help but notice Vivian going berserk, slashing at villagers indiscriminately, innocent or not. Perplexed, he turned to Hazard and asked what was wrong with Vivian, which Hazard admitted that he was just as clueless as this was the first time he had seen her behave like this. While Hazard was explaining things to him, Andreas realized that he really couldn't trust this guy. 
After all, leaving a wounded ally to fend for themselves spoke volumes about his character. However, the situation was spiraling out of control, so Andreas decided to play along with the conniving Hazar. Unexpectedly, the voice that had been haunting Andreas continued to chastise them for killing innocent villagers, which Hazar was surprised since this was his first time hearing a voice that echoed through the air, so he asked Andreas what was going on. To which Andreas explained to him that it was likely the black mage behind all this, and that they were probably near Supervisor Ivy, and as the bastard Hazar was, he seized the opportunity to make an excuse, pretending to be concerned about Ivy's safety as a way to separate himself from the group and hide to safety. Still, Andreas saw through Hazar's true intentions, finding his behavior too obvious. Nevertheless, he thought to himself that it was better than being betrayed outright, so he allowed Hazard to go to Ivy while he dealt with the situation at hand. Still, things were not looking good as Vivian continued to unleash her wrath upon the villagers, as if they owed her money. Andreas knew that the dark magic was driving her insane, and one wrong move could easily drag him into the chaos. Thus, he approached the situation with utmost caution. Unexpectedly, a swarm of villagers surrounded Vivian, ready to attack from all sides. Andreas braced himself, worried that she wouldn't be able to avoid their onslaught. However, his worries were quickly dispelled as Vivian not only evaded their attacks but also launched a powerful counterattack, impaling the villagers together like a skewered kebab. It was an impressive display of her combat skills. With this unexpected turn of events, the perpetrator couldn't resist the opportunity to reveal himself, realizing that Vivian's actions were not aligning with his plans. And now, standing before Andreas, he taunts him, asking what he plans to do next, now that he's all alone and abandoned by the only unharmed teammate. Andreas, maintaining his composure, calmly responds that he doesn't care about the Hazard's actions since he wasn't expecting anything from him anyway. Amused by Andreas' remarkably calm demeanor, the perpetrator remarks on it. Andreas, with a mischievous grin, explains that he just thought it was about time for the boss to make an entrance. After all, every good adventure needs a dramatic boss encounter to spice things up. Still, the masked man is puzzled by where Andreas got that unwavering confidence from. In recognition of his bravery, the masked man decides to give him a test of his own. And just as the masked man had said, a dark aura surrounds Andreas, enveloping him completely. Suddenly, he finds himself in a realm filled with stars, and his body begins to disintegrate. Confused and bewildered, Andreas opens his eyes to find himself back on the battlefield in his previous body. It dawns on him that everything he experienced as Andreas was just a dream. But there's no time to dwell on it as the relentless attacks from the enemy continue, forcing him to focus on survival. As he runs through the battlefield, he spots a familiar silhouette, leaving him in shock. It's his comrade Shohei on the brink of death. So without hesitation, he rushed to his aid, determined to save his brother in arms. As he holds Shohei, a fusion of memories floods his mind, intertwining the traumas of his past self with his current existence. Among the memories, he was reminded of his father's face and how he bestowed upon Andreas the family ring. Because as long as he has it, he will be recognized as the true lord of the Cromwell household. And in his last breath, he tells Andreas to not be burdened by this father of his anymore and just be happy together with Amy. With a sudden realization, Andreas knows exactly what to do, so he breaks free from the domain that the masked man had trapped him in, leaving the masked man in shock. Since the masked man believed it was nearly impossible to escape his curse of sloth, so he eagerly asked Andreas how he managed to break free. But Andreas couldn't care less about entertaining the masked man's questions, since he's fed up with all the tricks and games because, to him, the masked man's curse of sloth is nothing more than a pathetic attempt to exploit one's own traumas. Or perhaps it's simply because the masked man's abilities are just lacking. This triggers the masked man as he can't believe this kid has the audacity to claim it's a skill issue. So he summons his spear and attacks Andreas. But little does he know that the synchronization between Andreas and his previous body has been completed. Therefore, Andreas has acquired his previous life's talent in combat, reaching an exceptional rank. So he dodged the masked man's attack effortlessly, striking a nerve in his opponent. Andreas doubles down on his provocation, asking the masked man what he plans to do next. Enraged, the masked man aimlessly launches a barrage of attacks, while Andreas calmly evades them without breaking a sweat. However, even if the masked man isn't particularly strong, Andreas realizes he can't put an end to this confrontation without utilizing his necromancy. After all, it should be fine since no one is watching. So Andreas activates his skeleton summoning ability, but with only nine corpses raised out of the detected 23, it falls short of his expectations. Nevertheless, it is enough to deal with a bastard standing before him. At the same time, the masked man's eyes fill with shock as he comes to the realization that he's facing a necromancer. This revelation can only mean one thing, 
Andreas is affiliated with the congregation, the notorious black magic organization. Andreas, seeing the masked man's misunderstanding of his identity, decides to use it to his advantage. After all, a little misunderstanding can be a powerful tool to shake off his opponent. With this in mind, Andreas reveals to the masked man that he has been entrusted with the important task of recovering the page of sloth in the name of the congregation. This declaration made his opponent frantic as it made the battle more personal than it is. So the masked man goes all out, using everything in his arsenal to kill both the skeletons and Andreas. However, Andreas, now being more focused and skilled in battle, swiftly blocks the attack with his earth shield. And before the masked man can launch another attack, Andreas summoned Nickel for a surprise counterattack. So just as the masked man re-releases another strike, Nickel reveals himself and effortlessly cancels the masked man's attack. This leaves the masked man in disbelief that a mere skeleton was able to cut through his dark spear. Realizing that he cannot defeat Andreas with his skills alone, the masked man takes out the page of sloth and uses it to hinder Nickel's advances. He summons several hands under his command determined to end the battle quickly. As the battle intensifies, Nickel proves to be highly capable in fending off the masked man's attacks, while Andreas demonstrates quick reactions and skillful dodging, managing to evade all of the onslaught, well, as long as it's only at that speed. However, just when they think they've seen the masked man's fastest attacks, he reveals that he can go even faster. Still, as they struggle to dodge, Andreas notices that the masked man is also struggling to control his speed, indicating that he hasn't fully mastered the power of sloth. With this realization, Andreas decides to exploit the masked man's blind spot and strike him. So he rushes to Nickel's aid, but unfortunately, their opponent's attack overpowers them, leaving Andreas as the last one standing. Struggling to catch his breath, Frustrated, Andreas curses the masked man for killing his most precious skeleton. With this, the masked man is convinced that Andreas has nothing left in his arsenal and confidently plans to kill him, sending him to the same place where the skeleton is now. However, little did the masked man know that while he was entirely focused on attacking Andreas, Nickel had silently appeared behind him. And in a swift and precise move, Nickel sliced the masked man in half like a knife through butter. While the masked man finally realizes he has been fooled, but it's too late as his body splits perfectly down the middle. Meanwhile, Andreas stood tall, his acting skills proving to be deserving of an Oscar-worthy performance. Hit that like button and thanks for watching.